I don't speak to my mother. Or more true, she doesn't speak to me. This is excruciatingly evident as I mother my own child. When my seven-year-old asks questions like, why don't you talk to your mom? When I'm silent for a split second longer than normal, rapidly trying to figure out what to say, he will continue with, what happened when you were a kid? Did she hurt you? I feel a wave of bitterness that the term motherless mothers is reserved for women whose mothers have died. I say, no, no, she didn't hurt me. She loved me very much. We just don't get along right now. We can talk about it more when you're older. I have to be very careful about what I tell my little boy about my childhood with my mom. I tell him the good parts about how my mom and I would drive around singing along to oldies and getting frosties during the frosty summer, about how I helped her clean houses when I was little, and we sang songs for hours while we cleaned the toilets of the rich, rich white folks, about how she took out a 10-year loan to buy me a $300 flute. I tell him the funny bits, like how me and my sister would be locked out of the house during the summer to drink out of the water hose and eat from the orchard so she could do whatever it is moms do when they aren't being moms. I tell him about how she smelled like Marlboro Reds and gardenias and how her embrace feels like home no matter how long it's been. He puts together these tidbits of information and will infer things that cause him to ask more questions. He knows he isn't getting the whole story and I don't know how old he should be before he can hear it all. I can't tell him that his birth was the catalyst that awakened an anger towards my mother that caused me to shake with rage at what she did, or rather didn't do. I was eight years old, almost the same age as my son is now, when I was woken up by my mom dragging me out of my bed by my arm. She pulled me into my sister's room, and we huddled on the twin bed together in panic and confusion as my stepdad yelled, I swear to God, Claire, if you don't come down here, I'll do it. I swear to fucking God, get down here or you'll regret it. My mom pleaded with him to stop, screaming down the stairs as my sister and I clutched each other in terror. There was a gunshot, my mom's blood-curdling scream, and then silence. I clung to my mom's arm and begged her not to go downstairs. Please, mom, don't go, don't go. My parents fought all the time. It's what alcoholics do. They fight and destroy. That night has started like so many others that ended with screams and tears. You can tell when it was gonna be one of those nights. Music would be on in the kitchen, smashing pumpkins, and my parents would be happy, letting loose as the alcohol took hold. But then something would shift in my dad's eyes. Bliss turned to contempt as he watched me wash the dishes. I was washing yellow pan incorrectly, and my dad called me awful names. Little shit, dumbass, fucking lazy piece of garbage you never wanted. He told me, I only adopted you so I could marry your mom. My mom had defended me, and the fight that had ensued had the three of us, mom and two little girls, huddled together stricken with fear in the dark. When the front door slammed, we knew he hadn't killed himself. My mom was in shock and couldn't move. I ran to see where he had gone, looking out each window to watch him walking away from the house with a shotgun in his hand. My mom sat on the bed, crying. I stood next to her and comforted her, wiping her tears, telling my older sister it would be okay, and I kept watch. When I saw him coming back to the house, I started screaming, he's coming back, he's coming back, before I saw he didn't have the gun anymore. She tried to leave, I'll give her that. It takes domestic abuse victims about seven times before they stay gone for good. She would always make a big deal out of us telling us she was leaving, driving me and Rose to the middle of nowhere, sitting us down and telling us that she was done for good this time, that she would protect us. And we always came back. The fights continued to be bad, usually caused by something I did or said, and my dad's vitriol and wrath would descend upon me as my mom tried to protect me. I paid the, I paid the favor back when I was 11. I stepped between them as, I, as he pulled back his fist to hit her for something I had probably done. She stayed gone two months that time. It was during those two months that she decided to fix her relationship with her estranged mom. This led to my being sent off to my grandma's house all alone at the exact same age she was when her mom sold her for alcohol money at bars to old men. Her mom, my grandma, forced abortion after abortion on my mom so she could keep the alcohol money coming. My mom told me this when I was a child. So when I went to grandma's house when I was 11, I thought the same thing would happen to me. After all, according to my dad, I was a Lolita and could charm any man from the time he met me as a three-year-old. 
Instead of getting prostituted for alcohol money, I fell asleep to cockroaches crawling over me while my grandma got blackout drunk in the next room. I was hit pretty often. My mom hit me a few times with a shoe or a wooden spoon. But the arbiter of discipline with a belt, his hand, a giant paddle he carved out of wood, a switch from the tree, that was all my dad. And it never fails to make me laugh that my mom left, even if only for a few months, when he tried to hit her. But the running family joke was how all he had to do to get Savannah to act right is to hit her. It's like a reset button. She'll be good for a few days. I had a mental breakdown when I was 12 one night when my parents were fighting. I realized I had been molested by my stepbrother, my dad's only son, when I was five. It was like my brain was cracked open, and I shrieked for hours, pulling my hair out of the roots, realizing what was done and what it meant. My mom screamed at me that I needed to tell her all the details of what happened. I couldn't. If I thought about it, I would start shrieking again. And I tried to kill myself that month. My parents found God at some point, And the abuse and the worst of the drinking stopped for a few years. God is good like that, protecting the children of his believers. I started working a full-time job when I was 14 as a server in a restaurant and made sure that between that and soccer and band and school that I was never home. I was given a state-mandated psychologist after I tried to kill myself again when I was 16 and damn near succeeded for a few minutes. He was the first person to stick up for me, telling my mom, with me in the room, that I wasn't crazy and she needed to stop blaming her marital problems on me. He told me I needed to get the fuck out of that house as soon as possible. When I joined the Marine Corps and left a small town in Georgia, I came back less than five times over the next 14 years. One time was for a family reunion when I, was, when I graduated boot camp. I was sat next to my stepbrother in a room of over 40 people. And when I was visibly shaken by the seating arrangement, I was pulled aside by my grandmother and told, there are some things we need to endure as women. My mom watched me from another table. I went back when I was 22 during a cross-country road, road trip to explore America before I moved to Japan for three years with my husband. My dad started in on me almost immediately at the large family dinner with his usual insults and comments about what a horrible person I was, how lazy and selfish. My head sank down and I teared up. My husband stood up, told me to get up, and said I didn't deserve to be spoken to like that. We cut our time in Georgia short by a week and drove to Connecticut to visit his family instead. My mom flew up to Connecticut to see me before I left to live in Japan for three years. She was heartbroken that I left Georgia early and tried to make excuses for my dad. That's just how he is, you know? We drove to Niagara Falls for a weekend, smoked Cuban cigars and drank whiskey together in a motel, getting drunk for the first and only time together, talking about all sorts of things as adults. But we didn't talk about the past. It was the first time I saw her as a woman and not my mother. I saw the beginning of a new relationship with her struggling to emerge, where we could meet as equals, as friends who endured so much together at the hands of others. When I drove her to the airport, with a departure gate in view, she quietly said, I'm leaving your dad. For the first time in my life, I screamed at her instead of my dad. How dare she spend 14 hours in a car with me and not bring it up until right when I was dropping her at the gate? After dozens of times of her leaving him, I didn't give a shit now. She never fucking left, ever. It was the same cycle, the same bullshit in my childhood. She wanted to leave when he treated me like shit, but always came back. I told her to do whatever the fuck she wanted, but to leave me the fuck out of it because I was an adult and I didn't care if she stayed or left. She boarded the plane and went back to him. Conversations were strained from Okinawa, Japan to Black Island, Georgia in the years that followed. My mom acted like everything was fine and wanted me to speak to my dad. I would politely decline good old southern manners. My mom and I hardly spoke for almost two years, and then I had my own child. My mom had wanted to fly out for the birth of my child, and I was scared on this journey of motherhood and wanted her to hold my hand and tell me everything was going to be okay. I saw the pictures of her holding my sister as she gave birth to my nephew, the proud grandmother and the growing family she always wanted. I wanted my mom to hold me as I became a mom too. But the drinking had started again and so did her abusive pills. I couldn't have that as a new mom in Japan. If she got drunk and drove, as she often did, it would be an international incident that would impact my career. I couldn't trust her, and I asked her not to come. 
I don't think she ever forgave me for that. The moment I held that baby in my arms, an instant disbelief seared inside of me towards the woman that was supposed to have protected me. I looked at my child's tiny toes, listened to his giggles and coos, and saw someone so vulnerable that he relied on me for everything. How could my mom allow us to remain in that house? All I can radiate is pure disbelief now that I'm a mother. I can't imagine any scenario where anyone would treat my son how I was treated and I would allow to, them to continue to live. Of course, I'm fortunate to not be a battered woman with no support and only a high school diploma in the middle of nowhere, Georgia, she was. I understand that. And my heart aches that she tried so hard and had so few options. But I would murder someone for doing what all was done to me by my stepdad and his son. My mom knew, and she stayed. When I went back in 2019 for my grandma's funeral, she gave me a 15 minute heads up that my stepbrother would be coming by the house. I watched my dad embrace his son and they went on a walk. My dad hadn't hugged me. When I asked my mom how they could still speak to my stepbrother, she shrugged and said, you never told us what happened. I needed details and you didn't tell me. It's his only son. They have the relationship, not you and him. My dad looked at my kid and told me I needed to leave him with them for a few weeks and they would sort him out because you let him walk all over you. I shook with rage when I said I do not lay a hand on my son. I would not parent as my dad had, meticulously crafting a paddle in his workshop that would stand in for his attempt at patient education of how a child should behave. The paddle was over a foot long, flared at the end for better grip, carved from layers of plywood he glued and clamped together for hours until it was almost an inch thick. My sister's name was on one side of the paddle and mine was on the other. Every time I was hit, I had to write the transgression and the date of the offense. My side was so filled that I had to flip the paddle over and write on my sister's very empty side. My son, however, had never been hit by me and never would be. I've gone to therapy over the years and tried to sort out my childhood. This typically manifests as me trying to reach out to my mom to talk about what happened. I have continuously tried to bring up the abuses. She doesn't take accountability for her choices. My therapist says she can't, that the guilt would cause her psyche to break, especially because she continued to stay with him when she no longer had to. She told me last year that you just don't understand our marriage. I told her I didn't need to understand her fucking marriage, know that having a gunshot in the house was fucking abuse. The answer I received was silence. I have emailed her, texted her, called her. I've begged her to realize that her choices harmed me and to understand that I struggle as a mom myself to understand why she stayed. I write to her all the ways she did it right, how I know she tried so hard, how much I love her, and how much I see so much of her in me, especially when I look at the partners I've chosen to love and stay just a little too long. She doesn't respond. Maybe if she did respond, I could tell her that I struggled desperately not to make choices that mirror hers. And it physically, physically fucking hurts to choose a better path because the path in my brain, my learned experiences, tell me to do exactly as my mom did, as her mom did, choose the path of least resistance and stay. You know, God, mom, I get it. I get it. But then I look at my child and I'm able to usually just barely make the choice that protects him. Why couldn't she do that for me? And what happens when I grow tired of fighting the urge to repeat the cycle every fucking day? I see my choices laid out ahead of me, and I become frozen in fear that I'll become like her while also having no one else to model after. When my, mom see, or when my son sees that grandma doesn't speak to his mom when she calls, he knows something is wrong. He sees my eyes well up when I hear my mom say, hey, baby, to him like she used to say to me. He comes and strokes my face before we cuddle on the couch and read Captain Underpants, giggling together before I tuck him safely in his bed. I worry often what it'll be like when my mom dies, when I join the motherless mothers for real. I worry about when my emails and text messages are no longer ignored, only because they're never received. I stop short of begging her to speak to me, forgiving all, just so I can hear her say, hey baby, one more time, and have her hold me in the arms that still feel like home. Instead, I take the good parts of her as a mother, the singing in the car, the dramatic storytelling, the immense love of reading, and I pass these little bits of love along to my little boy. And the bad parts, 
they're within me. I see them. Sometimes I take them out and play with them, reflecting the heart-worn nostalgia of how thing, bad things could be, and then I choose a different way. Savannah Cannon, everybody.